and it's a great Thank you, contribution Pratt, your time to time has expired. We'll now move to question time and I call Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. An audit through questions on notice revealed almost 1,000 units of surveillance equipment provided by Chinese government-linked companies, Hike Vision and Dawa, are installed across more than 250 Commonwealth sites. I welcome Defence Minister Richard Miles' comments today that they will be removed from his department. Minister, is the government concerned about this national security risk at other departments and agencies? Uh, Minister Watt. Thanks. Uh, thank you, President. Um, and thank you, Senator Patterson, for the question. Uh, I have seen the media coverage regarding this issue uh, in, in the last couple of days. And what I can advise the Chamber is that the Attorney General has requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required to, to address protective security risks. Uh, of course, the Albanese government takes national security seriously, and we will always act in the national interest. Uh, some of you may have seen Senator Patterson, uh, the Defence Minister, Mr. Miles, uh, has made public commentary to the effect that the government is doing an assessment of all the technology for surveillance within the defence state, and where those particular cameras are found, then they're going to be removed. So there is an issue here, and we're going to deal with it. So I think the government has been very clear in taking responsibility for addressing this issue. Uh, I can also advise that the. Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and its portfolio agencies do not have any installed devices manufactured by the companies concerned. Uh, DFAT, Austrade and Tourism Australia retain some legacy uh, Hikvision or Dahua manufactured CCTV systems in non-sensitive areas, and these are not connected to the internet or agency IT networks. Of course, it is worth making the point that these cameras were installed not under the Albanese government but under a coalition federal government. Uh, so it is good that Senator Patterson is now taking an interest in this issue, an issue that neither he nor anyone else in the former government saw as uh, worthy of investigation at the time. Uh, but unlike the coalition government, uh, this government is taking action and, as I say, the Attorney General has requested advice on whether a government-wide ban is required to address protective security risks. Uh, as Senator Patterson knows, having asked those questions on notice, departments and agencies have provided answers to them. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Minister. When asked last year, the Department of Home Affairs said they did not know whether other government departments and agencies had these devices installed. Will the government now direct Home Affairs to conduct a formal audit of all Australian government sites to determine our exposure to these devices? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Um, well, Pat Senator Patterson, I think I've already answered that question by saying that the Attorney General has requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required to address protective security risks. So, of course, being government wide, uh, that does involve every part of this government and every agency, including the ones that you referred to. But again, I ask the question, why is Senator Patterson only asking about these issues now when he's on the opposition benches? Why didn't Senator Patterson uh, or anyone—why didn't Senator Rustin, why didn't Senator Cash, why didn't Senator Payne, why didn't Senator Hume, why didn't Senator Dunningham, why didn't Senator Henderson and why didn't Senator Patterson, among others, Senator McKenzie, think that this was an issue important enough when they were actually in government having these cameras installed? That was fine, uh, but now, after the event, uh, it's worthy of asking questions. These are serious matters. I have no doubt about it, and that's exactly why the Albanese government is taking action, unlike the former Morrison, Turnbull, Abbott and whoever else there was government. Thank you, Minister Watt. Uh, Senator Pedersen, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, in November last year, two of our closest security partners, the United States and the United Kingdom, announced they were effectively banning the devices from government premises. Will the Australian government follow and direct government departments and agencies beyond defence to remove these devices? Senator, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Uh, well, again, for the third time, uh, the government, through the Attorney General, has requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required uh, to address protective security risks. Uh, if that advice says that that is necessary, then I have no doubt that we will take that action. Uh, but yet again, again, for the third time, 
Why were these matters not serious enough for the former government to do something about them when they actually had the opportunity to do so, when these cameras were actually being installed? Uh, it's all very well to be wise after the event and ask questions about things that happened when you were in government, but I would suggest that the time to actually do something about it is when you're in government making the decisions to install the cameras rather than trying to call into question a government which is taking serious action on this, just as we're taking serious action on national security in general. Thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Um, can the minister outline how the policies of the Albanese Labor government will assist people, Australian households, to manage the cost of living? <clears throat> minister. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Grogan for her question and for her focus on cost of living uh, pressures for Australians, including those from the good state of South Australia, where uh, who uh, she very represents. Fine state. Thank you. Very, very fine Indeed. State. Sitting next to another proud South Australian. Can I begin by acknowledging that the decision by the Reserve Bank this week to raise interest rates uh, will have quite will have become as quite unwelcome news to households across Australia. Whether you're a mortgage holder or a renter, news of the interest rate rise that knowingly that it will cause extra stress on household budgets. The government has been working day in and day out since being elected to look at ways to bring sensible and responsible and affordable cost of living relief to Australian households. And whilst we can't control what the Reserve Bank does with respect to interest rates, we can be a government that focuses on those measures designed to make life easier and look at ways uh, being focused to put downward pressure on some of those cost of living increases which we have uh, been seeing. What is in our control are measures to support and subsidise Australians in buying things that are essential. We're supporting everyday Australians through policies like our cheaper medicines, which came into um, being on the 1st of January. Importantly, our cheaper childcare, which for over a million Australian households um, will make childcare more affordable, and of course, reducing the increases on energy bills that those opposite opposed in December last year. Our cheaper childcare reforms were really important reforms, uh, Madam President about making it more affordable for families, but also that it's good economic policy. In turn, the um, extra resourcing and investment into childcare supports greater workforce participation, especially by women. But we've also got our fee-free TAFE policy, so we're investing Thank in you, skills. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the minister could um, give us some further detail on how the cheaper childcare uh, measures could assist with the cost of living. Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. And yes, I can. And I thank Senator Grogan for the question. The cheaper childcare plan will, co will cut the cost of early childhood education and care for more than a million Australian families, 1.26 million Australian families. A plan, of course, that we know the Noalition over there, the opposition opposed no. during the no. election. No. Say no to everything. No. That's what you're known for. Say no to everything. The Noalition over there. Say no. No to energy bill price relief. Order, couldn't agree with that. Order, couldn't down. agree with any. Couldn't agree with one and a half billion dollars going to e order. ease the prices of those energy increases. Could you? No. No. More jobs for Australians. No. More investment in manufacturing. No. No. Childcare. No. Just a big no from you guys. Well, we're getting on with the job. Investing in childcare. Uh, for families earning $120,000, it Thank will you, mean Minister. a saving of $1,700. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. That was very, very informative. I know that's going to make a significant difference to the people of South Australia and across the country. Um, could you outline what other plans that the Albanese Labor government has to reduce the cost of living? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I can assure the Senate that every day that we come to work, we are focused on easing cost of living pressures on yeah, Australian yeah. households, yeah, yeah. of making the sensible and responsible policy responses where we can 
to show spending restraint in the budget so that we don't add to inflation, that we deal with the supply chain issues, that we deal with the visa backlog that we inherited. I don't know. I don't even think you guys were awake in the last year of government when you were in there, because certainly all the work we inherited, you must have been asleep at the table. Or maybe let the former Prime Minister do all the jobs. Remember that? He did have all the jobs. Or you guys go to sleep. I'll not do any of the jobs that I've just taken off you. We inherited the visa backlog, the skill shortages, the lack of investment in TAFE. These are the areas that we are focused on. We're addressing them one by one, cleaning up the mess of a government that had been there way too long. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fishers and Forestry, Senator Watt. I refer to the report to the government by the Grattan Institute, Fueling Budget Repair, How to Reform Fuel Taxes for Business, which recommends reducing the fuel tax credit for off-road use. Does the minister acknowledge the importance of the diesel fuel rebate to Australia's heavy vehicle industry, farmers, fishers, forestry operators and the resources sectors, which are all producing the food, fibre and minerals needed to support the national economy? And can he provide an assurance to the agriculture sector in particular that the government will rule out any changes to the diesel fuel rebate? Good question. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. The short answer to your questions is yes and yes. The longer version is that yes, uh, I do recognise the importance of this, uh, this uh, payment and re rebate for farmers. Uh, it is an important way uh, for farmers to manage their budgets. Uh, and for that reason, I can confirm that this government has no intention whatsoever uh, of getting rid of it. I recognise that the Grattan Institute has made that uh, suggestion, uh, but we have categorically ruled it out, both myself and the Prime Minister. And may I point, may I recommend Senator McKenzie to my Twitter feed, uh, a very worthwhile resource where people interested in agriculture can find all sorts of information. Uh, and I direct Senator McKenzie in particular to a tweet that I did not today, not yesterday, not the day before, but on Monday uh, in response to, Senator, to David Littleproud, Mr Littleproud's comments on this matter. And my tweet says, quote, another day, another baseless scare campaign from David Littleproud. Changes to the fuel tax credit are not on the government's agenda. We're not ending the weekend, we're not ending the backyard barbecue, and we're not ending this either. Poor David. Uh, I guess I should probably add on this occasion, poor Senator McKenzie. Um, the information has been out there in the public domain for four days, uh, where I ruled it out. The Prime Minister has ruled it out. I've also done ABC Capricornia, a, a radio station I recommend you uh, listen to as well, Senator McKenzie, and all of your colleagues. Uh, so I have ruled it out repeatedly. Uh, but if you haven't caught up with that fact, maybe you're a little bit behind the times. It's not happening. It never was happening. It was a David Littleproud idea. And guess what? Yet again, he's wrong. And, uh, Senator White, I do remind you when you're referring to people in the other place to use their correct titles. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. It will come to no surprise, as Senator Watt, that his Twitter feed is not something I wake up and uh, what, read every single morning. Uh, and I, too, give a huge shout out to uh, the ABC in Capricornia. My supplementary one, I refer to the reliance of Australia's fishing fleet on the fuel tax credit scheme and their vessels to catch no well, I don't I'm not sure that was I had a minute to ask there I want the fishing industry's fuel um, credits also uh, time. Thank guaranteed you, Senator McKenzie Minister Watt. Thank you uh, president uh, and in my experience usually when you're in a hole you stop digging uh, I have made it clear now through Twitter through ABC Capricornia, through other media outlets, through answering a question in the Senate chamber, uh, that touching the diesel fuel rebate is not on this government's agenda. We are not considering it. We are not working on it. And that applies to farmers, to fishers, to foresters, to anyone else who takes advantage of this. Uh, so uh, that is not on our agenda. And again, this has been a matter of public record for three or four days. Uh, so I'm a little concerned that Senator McKenzie and her team aren't keeping up to date with what announcements and commitments the government has made and instead choose to perpetuate these scare campaigns day after day. I'll tell you one other thing about fishers and about farmers. 
They have welcomed the cooperative approach from the Albanese government in dealing with them, and I have lost count of the number of farm groups, fisher groups and other groups who have, who have made the point that they welcome a government that's actually collaborating with them, listening to them and not lecturing them. Thank you, them. Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. Thank you. The viability of many agricultural economies is enhanced by the contribution of the mining industry, which directly employs over 285,000 skilled workers. Given the importance of the resources industries, will the minister provide an assurance to, that the government will retain the fuel tax credit scheme in its current form for the, resource, no, for the resources industry? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, well, I'm not the minister representing the Minister for Resources, but I'm happy to uh, refer you to my previous answer to your previous question, the one before that as well, uh, my tweets, my ABC radio interviews and all of my other interviews, where I've said um, that we are not considering this matter, uh, and as many times as you might like to say so um, in whatever minister way— Mark, please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you on relevance, uh, Madam President. The minister, in his previous answer to my uh, first you, supplementary, talked about I listened very not carefully. I'd ask you to resume industry. your seat. You've, you've pointed me to relevance, and the minister is being relevant. Please continue. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, the, we are not considering any changes to the diesel fuel rebate in, as it applies to any industry whatsoever. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, that this will go down in the big rubbish bin that is overflowing with National Party scare campaigns, along with a $100 lamb roast around signing the methane pledge was going to end the ba backyard barbecue. We were going to end the weekend. Uh, what else? Have we, what else? Will we, why, we were going to wipe out Wyala. I'm pretty sure it's still on the map, Senator Grogan. You were there recently. Um, there must be some more that I've forgotten. The National Party are constantly full of it, and country people have worked them out. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last week the IMF, who it has to be said are one of the chief agents of neoliberalism around the planet, suggested that Labor's stage three tax cuts should be reassessed. Here in Australia, everyone to the left of Malcolm Turnbull thinks that the stage three tax cuts should be ditched. Should be ditched, Minister. Minister, does your government really believe that Labor's stage three tax cuts are good policy? Do you really believe that a quarter of a trillion dollars in tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefit the top end of town is preferable to putting dental and mental health into Medicare, making childcare free and wiping out student debt? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I uh, thank Senator McKim for the question and his ongoing interest in this portfolio space. Uh, I recognise, and I think we all recognise in this chamber, that there are different views around the stage three tax cuts, but our policy and our position on those tax cuts hasn't changed. Our priority when it comes to tax reform is the tax reform we outlined in the October budget, which is around ensuring multinationals pay their fair share of tax here on, in Australia. Uh, we also acknowledge that those tax cuts aren't scheduled to come in, and I think, till 2024. Uh, and we are focused on the near-term challenges in the economy, including how we ease cost of living pressures on households. They are the, uh, challenge, the, the inflation challenge and dealing with the associated cost of living um, impacts that, that it's having is our main focus in terms of the economic portfolio. But you raise a broader question as well around uh, the budget and pressures on the budget. And there is no doubt that the economic and budget vandals that sit opposite us had left the budget in That's such right. a terrible state. Well, I'm not going to let you get away. I'm not going to let you get away with this view. I'm not. I'm not. Zombie measures, Order. terminating measures, Order. the pork barrelling Order. and the failure to deal with the big the pressures on the budget that happen on your watch that we have been left to resolve. We need to manage, and we are the fiscal responsible managers of the budget. And people will see, as we go through the detail of what we inherited, just what vandals you were, uh, looking out and saying we're managing everything while sweeping it all under the carpet, pork barrelling to friends, 
failing to fund Sam things McGrath. properly and having them all fall off a funding cliff in June this year. That's the legacy you leave, and that's the challenge that we are dealing with in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, you mentioned inflation in your answer, and the Treasurer said this week, and I quote, Labor has a plan for inflation. The RBA is forecasting that inflation will be above their target band when the stage three tax cuts come into effect next year. Isn't it the case that the stage three tax cuts are grossly inflationary? Is putting another $9,000 a year into the pockets of billionaires part of your government's plan to address inflation? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, the Treasury, of course, forecasts um, in the budget uh, our, their view, their Treasury forecasts for inflation uh, over the forward estimates, which will include uh, the stage three tax cuts when they come into operation. And you can see what the Treasury forecasts there in terms of inflation, and it's forecasting that inflation will uh, track back towards norm more normal bands over uh, the more normal range over the next 18 months. Um, the um, Senator McKim also said we uh, the Treasurer had outlined a plan for inflation, and we do. We're, we do have a plan for inflation. It's a three-point plan, cost of living relief, where we can sensibly and meaningfully make a difference without adding to inflation, which is our childcare, our relief for energy bills, our investments in cheaper medicines, to deal with the supply chain issues, which is workforce and skills, and to show budget and spending restraint in May. They are the, that is the plan that we have and it, that we are implementing. Thank you, Minister. Se um, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. Minister, most Australians know that you only supported the stage three tax cuts to neutralise the issue to win the election. Isn't it the case that your position now boils down to not doing the right thing because you promised in your own self-interest to do the wrong thing? Minister, how's Labor's political cowardice helping the millions of Australians who are struggling with rents, mortgage rises, the cost of living crisis, and who will get pennies on Thank a dollar at a stage three competitive— Order. 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 Minister. There was a lot in that, President. Uh, there was a lot, and I give credit to you, Senator McKim, for managing to squash that into 30 seconds. We covered a whole range of issues then. I, I do not accept the points uh, made, uh, the negative reflections on our motivations around self-interest. Uh, we wanted to change the government. We managed to change the government. Uh, and we think that is good for the country. We think that is good for the country in the fact that we are now able to implement all of the policies that we took, our positive policies around climate uh, and dealing with those issues that you've, you've been interested and involved in for some time. Uh, but we are uh, in government, we are dealing with the inflation challenge. We're dealing with some significant budget pressures. We've got to focus on households, cost of living, easing cost of living pressures where we can, where it doesn't add to inflation and doesn't make the job of the Reserve Bank harder. This is the job that the Treasurer and I do every day, day in, day out, and we'll continue Thank to you, do Minister, so. Your time has expired. Senator Dodson. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, uh, Senator Watt. In my home state of Western Australia, we have seen flooding in the Kimberley and fires down south. Can the minister please provide an update on what support the Commonwealth is providing to communities impacted during this high-risk weather season? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And can I thank uh, Senator Dodson for his question and also his fine leadership uh, in the Kimberley uh, throughout these devastating floods. And I do recognise that there are a number of senators and members across all sides of politics who've played a very important role, and I thank all of them as well. Before directly addressing uh, Senator Dodson's question, I'd also like to just give a quick update on the deployment of Australian personnel to Turkey. Tomorrow it is expected that a deployment of 72 personnel from New South Wales Fire and Rescue, DFAT and the National Emergency Management Agency will depart for Turkey, where they will then be tasked by local authorities in supporting search and rescue efforts. These urban search and rescue personnel have internationally recognised skills, and I'm sure they will provide much needed support in the ongoing efforts across the impacted communities. I'd like to thank those personnel for this incredible undertaking, and I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I wish them well for a safe return. 
In the meantime, the Albanese government is continuing to work closely with the Western Australian government to support the ongoing recovery in the Kimberley following the recent devastating flooding. Two NEMA officers have been deployed to two locations in Western Australia to work in the Western Australian Department's offices in Perth and with the local council in Derby, West Kimberley. NEMA is also working closely with the National Indigenous Australians Agency to identify recovery needs at the community level. Of course, there are a large number of First Nations people who have been dramatically affected by these uh, events, and the Albanese government believes it's essential that traditional owners are part of the conversation on how we support the Kimberley communities and to make sure the recovery happens the way those communities want and need. Again, I'd like to thank Senator Dodson for his ongoing engagement with myself, my office and all of those communities around their recovery needs in the Kimberley. I was on the ground with Senator Dodson and the Prime Minister in Fitzroy Crossing in early January, and I've seen the power of work being done. In total, more than $2.5 million in Commonwealth disaster assistance has been provided to around 3,200 people in affected communities in Western Australia today, and there's a range thank of joint you, support Minister still Watt. available. The time has expired. Senator Dodson, first supplementary. Uh, last year, nearly every state and territory in Australia was impacted by natural disasters. Can the minister please outline what this government is doing to ensure communities that have been impacted are getting the support they need? Minister. Thanks, thanks President, and thanks again, Senator Dodson. I'm very pleased to say that under the Albanese Labor government, no matter what your postcode, no matter what electorate you live in, if you've been hit by a natural disaster, you will receive support. Since May, our, in our after our election, our government has provided $1.6 billion in direct payments to natural disaster impacted communities across Australia through the various recovery payments available. It is a sobering fact that $1.5 billion of this $1.6 billion has been delivered to residents of the state of New South Wales. We recognise that New South Wales communities have faced devastating and compounding flooding events over the last 12 months, and we recognise that it's our responsibility as the federal government to show up in a crisis and keep showing up to help. What we don't recognise is whether those communities voted Labor, Liberal or National, and that's why, regardless of politics, we've continued to provide disaster funding into the hundreds of millions of dollars to very safe National Party seats because those people need help. That is the right thing to do, and that is exactly what we will keep doing. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dodson, second supplementary. Uh, is the Minister aware of any examples when government was not insured, communities impacted by natural disasters? were to deliver the support that they needed. Minister. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Dodson. Unfortunately, just this week, we have seen that not all governments follow the apolitical approach of the Albanese government in supporting communities impacted by natural disasters. I was appalled to read reports that former New South Wales Deputy Premier and New South Wales Nationals Party leader John Barillaro redirected funding away from certain communities that were devastated by the Black Summer bushfires. And why do you think funding was ripped away from them by the former Nationals leader in New South Wales? For one reason and one reason alone, and that's because they were held in state seats held by Labor members. It seems the rotting disease that was in epidemic proportions under the federal Liberals and Nationals also spread its way to New South Wales. What is it with the Nationals? and rorting public funds, because we, knew, we know the federal nationals have lots of form on this. Let's forget about sports rorts for a moment. Let's forget about regional rorts. It even happened with disaster funding as well. Who will ever forget that in the Northern Rivers, federal national seats got funding and Labor seats didn't? That is a disgraceful way to occur, and it will never uh, happen under you, our Minister. government. The time for answering this question has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Uh, thank, um, Senator Tyrrell, please resume your seat. I have Senator Tyrrell on her feet. As I've reminded this place before, the crossbench get limited opportunities for questions, and to continue talking as she stood was rude and disrespectful. Please listen with respectful silence. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. I appreciate it. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Gallagher. Minister, last year this parliament passed the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Act 2022. This act primarily responds to recommendations made by the Royal Commission into Aged Care on Nursing. This act will be fully in effect from 1 July 2023. This week it was reported in the examiner back in Tassie that there was an aged care resident in Tasmania who spent the whole night bleeding. The rusted nurse took unplanned leave and the only nurse available was on call about two hours away. Will the legislation we passed last year ensure tragedies, tragedies like this won't happen again? 
Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question and for her um, focus on health um, and aged care in uh, her state of Tasmania. Um, I haven't seen that news report, Senator Tyrrell, but uh, I think uh, those stories have been far too common in aged care, which is why uh, we took the policy to the election that we did around implementing uh, nurses 24-7 into aged care facilities and increasing the care minutes. Um, I think uh, the, the health on responding to some of the health challenges in aged care uh, has been very difficult um, for uh, providers where nurses have not been available. Uh, and I know that the aged care minister, in fact, I met with her yesterday on aged care matters, um, has been absolutely focused on making sure that we can um, that the nurse care, the nursing 24/7, uh, is implemented. That we are looking at workforce shortages where they are and how we deal with those, um, and working with providers because the aim is that people who live in residential aged care have access 24-7 to nursing care, which is something that they haven't had, uh, particularly in small um, and regional areas. Um, I, I spent some time working in aged care and visited a number of aged care facilities, uh, and those aged care staff do an incredible job caring for people, often with very complex health conditions. Sometimes uh, residential aged care Facilities are actually more like a subacute hospital than an aged care than your traditional thinking of what an aged care facility would be because of the complexity of the residents who who are living there. So, um, my answer to you, Senator Tyrrell, is that is the aim of the policy um, uh, to make sure that people's health needs, residents' health needs, are addressed, and we have access to that professional service 24/7. The time's expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. I hear that and I appreciate that. But the facility that's in question um, has been assessed by the Commonwealth and has met the aged care quality standards. How can the standards be up to scratch when they allow people to lie in bed for hours bleeding from wounds that nobody treats? This person was actually sent to hospital the next morning when people came on shift. So the situation was it wasn't just a little scratch. So we just want things to be right and we hear that it's a problem that needs to be fixed, but you know, we're here, we're the grown-ups in the room, which I've heard. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I, I thank uh, Senator Tyrrell for the uh, question, I, and I agree it, it wasn't a scratch. Uh, and this has been part of the issue, particularly overnight, even on weekends, with uh, residents of aged care deteriorating to the point that they end up acutely unwell uh, when they are transferred to hospital or if they are able to be transferred uh, there uh, before they, they decline. Uh, that is the aim of the 24-7 um, nursing requirement. I know the Minister for Aged Care has been working, indeed, even with the Minister for Immigration on how we deal with some of the significant workforce challenges that are presented. Uh, part of it is dealing with um, some of the legacy issues we've inherited, incl including fixing some of the other workforce shortages which we'll be doing through the aged care uh, wages increase. And any suggestion that the 24-7 registered nurse requirement won't be in Enforced, uh, is false. It will be enforced, and providers are aware of that in their discussions uh, with the Minister for Thank Aged you, Minister. Care. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. President. Tasmania papers and papers around the country are full of horrible cases of neglect. People are coming to our offices in particular. That's who I'm speaking for. The Jackie Lambie Network has been calling for an urgent audit into all aged care homes in Tasmania. Can you help facilitate that? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question, and I'll certainly relay uh, that to the Minister for Aged Care. She, uh, as you know, we have other measures underway to improve the quality uh, of aged care, including the new star ratings for residential aged care to provide older people and their families with transparency on quality. Um, we've got the extension of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to home care, a new conduct, code of conduct for approved providers, aged care workers and governing persons from the 1st of December. Uh, I'm not saying this is easy and it will fix some of the quality issues overnight. It won't, but uh, these are important reforms uh, that send the very strong message 
uh, that Australians expect quality aged care to be provided to elderly Aust Australians, that the government has a role in supporting that. We, we will be doing that with our investments in the aged care workforce and our investments in 24-7 nursing care, and we'll work with providers to continue to improve it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Wong. I refer to yesterday's Twitter announcement by Ms Plibersek that she will block Central Queensland Coal's application to operate a coal mine 130 kilometres from Rockhampton. Minister, how many people would have been employed at the mine and what would its economic impact have been for Queensland and Australia if it had been approved? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Senator for uh, the question. Uh, and I understand from uh, reports that this is uh, a coal mine uh, that Mr Palmer has some interest in uh, from the media reports. Uh, and I understand that yesterday uh, Ms Plibersek, as the relevant minister, made a decision in relation to this mine. Uh, the minister is obviously uh, uh, entitled uh, or empowered under the legislation, which has been in place uh, for many years. Uh, my, my, my recollection is there were changes to it uh, made by Mr Senator Hill when he was environment minister in a coalition government. Uh, the minister is required to decide uh, every project on a case by case, as she is required to do by law. Uh, I understand from public statements, uh, and I assume there was um, uh, a, a, an appropriate documentation release, uh, that she has not approved the project because the risks of the Great Barrier Reef, freshwater creeks and groundwater are too great. Uh, the, uh, the Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you. Relevance. We know the background of the question I've asked specifically about employment and economic impact on Queensland. Uh, thank you. Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald, you also referred to, to, to the Twitter feed, I think, of the minister. Minister Wong. I'm very happy to talk about Queensland jobs. And the, que and the, re the Great Barrier Reef contributes approximately $6 billion to the Australian economy—64,000 jobs. Wong. But they're clearly not jobs Senator you want to Wong, ask about, are they? Please resume your seat. Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald. I appreciate you don't like high-vis jobs, Senator Wong. My question uh, is Senator about McDonald, Senator how McDonald, many people— Senator Macdonald, when you stand, if you have a point of order, please say it's a point of order. That's not a point of order. Thank you. Minister Wong, please continue. Oh, well, I certainly enjoyed Senator Canavan wearing high-vis around his backyard, <laughs> that very dangerous backyard while he's putting up his, his clothesline. And um, Senator, Minister you talk Wong. about high fees jobs. Well, you make Minister the interjection. Wong. I'll respond. Minister, I'll respond. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Scar, I already have Senator Macdonald on her feet. I will go to her, and then, if necessary, I will come to you. Order, order, Senator Macdonald. Uh, point of order is relevance and respecting the chamber in the process of answering the question asked. Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. I will remind the minister of your question. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to sit down? I have reminded the minister of your question, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Be to uh, respond to the senator because I wasn't the one who did that. So if she's going to do that, you're going to get a response, yeah. aren't you? You're going to get a response. Uh, the, the minister has obviously considered, Senator Macdonald. The, the, the minister has obviously considered uh, the impacts on the environment and the and employment. Um, Senator Macdonald, order, order. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question. Senator Macdonald. Minister, what is the government's alternative plan and solution to replace all of the lost energy production, the jobs, the direct and indirect investment that would otherwise have been generated across Queensland and the nation if this mine had been approved? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Wong. Uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Wong, uh, please uh, resume your seat. Uh, uh, Order. Senator, Senator Watt, I have a senator on his feet. Order. Order across the chamber. Senator Scar. President, uh, Senator Watt made uh, a reflection, uh, impugned the motive, impugned the motive 
of, of Senator Macdonald with respect to asking questions. He, referred, he, he said you're still asking questions for Clive. That impugns the motive of the senator. He should uh, withdraw. Senator Scar, he should withdraw. Your seat. Order. 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 Uh, senator Rustin, I've called order at least three times and you continue to shout out. That is disrespectful. I'm, I did not hear the interjections because there were interjections across the chamber. I'm sure if I ask Senator Watt to reflect on what he said and not repeat the offence, he will withdraw in the interests of the chamber. I withdraw. Thank you. Senator, I think we, I called the minister to answer your question, Senator Macdonald. Well, I, I want to talk, I'm very happy to be asked about jobs and I, I would make the point that uh, first, uh, in relation to this, this mine, uh, well, sorry, I was asked about energy first. I'm advised that this was an export-only mine, so obviously there's no energy into our energy grid. Oh. Secondly, I'd also, also know, in addition to the 64,000 jobs, which were obviously weighing, I assume, on the minister's mind, I would note also that the government is serious about ensuring uh, that we invest in industry and jobs through our National Reconstruction Fund, an important part of ensuring st strong manufacturing jobs, high-vis jobs here in Australia. And isn't it interesting? Those, those who talk about jobs are about to oppose it. That's right. Are about to oppose it. So if you want to come in here, Senator, and talk about Australian jobs, we're very happy to talk about Australian jobs and all the jobs you're voting against. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. In all of her time as a minister in the Albanese government. How many coal projects across Australia has Ms Plibersek approved? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, well, I, I am only aware uh, of this decision. Uh, I will take on notice uh, what other decisions uh, I am able to uh, that, uh, that have been made. Obviously. Uh, my recollection is that ministers don't discuss what is before a minister until the final decision has been made, but I'm very happy, Senator, to take it on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bebet. My question is to the minister representing the health minister, Minister Gallagher. Minister, in November 2022, I raised with you the issue of excess mortality as reported by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Now, the most recent full report from the ABS shows that for the first nine months of 2022, there were nearly 20,000 excess deaths, which is about 16% uh, about more than the baseline average. Now, of those, 8,160 deaths were attributed to COVID-19, so where's the rest from? Now, Minister, can you please confirm if a Department of Health has investigated this large increase in excess, in, in excess mortality, and if they have, can you advise the Senate what is causing this spike in deaths? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Babette for the question and also for uh, the advance um, indication that he would be asking a question around excess deaths. I can say that uh, the Department of Health uh, would, as routine, uh, look at the reports that come out through the ABS. As uh, the senator indicated in his question, the reports that the ABS does into mortality statistics, um, the reports that they do on the causes of death, and of course uh, the Department of Health would look at those and examine those to see uh, if there are any trends or issues of concern. Um, I think uh, I'm advised that it's important to note that increases in deaths from a range of uh, other causes not related to COVID-19, because there is an indication of ex excess deaths related to COVID-19, have also been observed in 2022. And examples include deaths due to dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, which were 25.6 per cent above the baseline average in June, and 21.8 per cent above the baseline average for the year uh, to June. Um, and while the number of COVID-19 cases and associated deaths has increased in 2022, I think it is important to understand that the proportion of COVID-19 associated deaths relative to the numbers of cases 
of COVID-19 has decreased overall, which highlights the positive impact of the health measures, of the changes in uh, transmission, the vaccination and the reduced severity of the Omicron variant, variant and subvariants when compared to earlier COVID-19 variants uh, such as Delta. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Now, you mentioned some causes of death there, but you didn't mention myocarditis and pericarditis. Now, this is an issue which is now in the mainstream media. Even Carl Stefanovic talked about it on Channel 9 recently. He said he wouldn't take more than two jabs because he had concerns relating to heart issues. Now, Minister, is the government confident, confident that none of this is because of the N mRNA injection? Minister. Um, President, I thank uh, Senator Bebek for this uh, supplementary. Uh, and uh, I would say that um, COVID-19 as a virus also impacts uh, the health and has those health consequences. So pericarditis, myocarditis is also, if you have a bad case, a severe case of COVID-19, that is a, is a side effect, a consequence of that. And I would also say that uh, the data shows that for those who are unvaccinated, so haven't had a vaccine, primarily an mRNA vaccine, um, they are much more more likely to end up in ICU or passing away. So those who are, are not vaccinated or not up to date with their vaccination. And for people in my age group, it's 32 times more likely to end up in hospital if you're not vaccinated. So um, the answer to the question is, yes, we are confident. The, the government and the approving authorities are confident that the mRNA vaccine is safe you, and we urge the people to be vaccinated. Has Senator Bebet, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Now, Minister, given that you're so confident— Order! Order! Minister, given that you're so confident that mRNA is so safe and is so effective, when is the government going to release the data to support this claim? When are you going to talk to a target and tell them to give us the information? Are you going to do this, Minister? Thank you, Senator Bebet, Minister. Well, the, thank you. And I would say the safety of the vaccine is, is uh, whilst Atagi has a role about the uh, provision of the vaccine, who should be provided the dose, the approving authority is the TGA, and they do publish adverse events uh, through um, quite frequent reporting. I think it's either weekly or monthly reporting of adverse events, events relating to vaccination status. I would also say that, of course, people are entitled to get advice from their health professional about whether the vaccine is safe for them and take that advice. But I would also urge people, with the fifth dose becoming available, to please remain up to date with your vaccinations. It's not just an individual decision. This is the thing. It's not just about an individual decision and keeping yourself safe. It's keeping other people safe from, these vac from this uh, virus, people who aren't able to be as protected as some of us. So it's actually a community responsibility to be vaccinated. Thank you, Minister. Uh, order across the chamber. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Minister, the Albanese Labor government finalised a trade agreement with India late last year, which is now benefiting Australian businesses, including in my home state of Tasmania. Can the minister outline some of the opportunities this agreement has created for local businesses and jobs? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and can I thank uh, Senator Billett for her wonderful interest, uh, not only in trade but tourism, uh, in her wonderful home state of Tasmania, which I'll be visiting tomorrow, oh, terrific. Uh, hopefully with her um, and some of our other great uh, um, Tasmanian now. senators. <laughs> but look, this is a very important question that she's asked, and the, uh, um, the Albanese Labor government is getting on with the job of diversifying our trade in important markets like uh, India. On 1 January 2020, uh, 2023, the second tariff cut under the Australian-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement took effect. And in the month of January, Australian businesses benefited from the tariff cuts 
on over $2.5 billion worth of exports into I'll repeat that figure, $2.5 billion worth of exports into India. This means more opportunities for our seafood, our meat, our fruits, our wine and our critical mineral exporters. And it means cheaper products for Australian households like groceries, like fruit, like nuts and clothing. This deal has been a long time coming. Former Prime Minister Julia Gillard kicked off the trade negotiations in India over 10 years ago. And under the Anthony Albanese Labor government, we finished the job by bringing an Indian. Yes, we, we, we did the job. We did the job that you failed to do or couldn't do. And uh, we finished the job by bringing an Indian trade deal into force. More trade means more and higher paying jobs for Australian workers. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. Does the minister have any specific examples of businesses that have started to use the provisions under the agreement to grow and expand trade with India? Thank you, Senator Billick. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Billick, thanks again for that question. As a matter of fact, I do. Um, there are, some, there are many great examples in the senator's home state of Tasmania, which I'm looking forward to visiting tomorrow. For example, for example, you'd be welcome. Senator Colbeck would be welcome. Anything, anything to res restore the damage that you have done. For example, Hobart-based fisheries company Australian Longline, who have benefited from tariff cuts on exports to India or the Western Australian Geraldton Fishermen's Cooperative, who recently secured an Indian distributor to supply fresh lobsters uh, because of our free trade agreement. Of course, they're getting into uh, China as well. One in four Australian jobs relate to trade, and our trade diversification agenda is delivering more high-paying jobs to Australians. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you very much. The trade agreement is part of the government's plans to diversify trading opportunities. What other actions is the government taking to diversify trading relationships and how will local businesses benefit? Minister. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, thank you again, uh, Senator Billick, for your question. And you're exactly right um, about, about, about our diversification policies. The Albanese Labor government is getting started on our trade diversification agenda with this important economic partner. Next month, uh, I will travel to India uh, with the Prime Minister and a business delegation to seize the opportunity under our existing free trade deal and advance negotiations on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. We're supporting Australian businesses to diversify their trade um, and deliver secure, high-paying jobs for Australian workers and Tasmanian workers. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Senator Watt, is the current rate of real wages growth positive or negative? Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. And it is my uh, I'm very pleased to be able to advise the chamber that under the Albanese government, wages are increasing at a level we have not seen for a very long time. Now, we, over a decade, in fact, uh, over the whole decade that the Morrison government was in power, it did not reach the level of wage growth that is occurring in our country. Now, we know, we know uh, that inflation is continuing to have an effect uh, on Australians' cost of living. Uh, and that's exactly why we've taken the steps that we have to address cost of living, such as the ones that Senator Gallagher was talking about. Cheaper medicines, cheaper childcare, fee-free TAFE places, uh, and of course, most importantly, the energy price relief that the Albanese government delivered late last year, which was opposed by every single member opposite. So that's what the Albanese government is doing on cost of living. But we recognise that this job is not done, uh, and we recognise that Australians are doing it tough at the moment. Uh, and that's why we will continue to take action on cost of living, and that's why we'll continue to take action on wage growth as well. Because let's not forget uh, that, unlike the coalition government, 
this government made a submission to the Fair Work Commission supporting a pay rise for aged care workers. Uh, unlike the former, commission, uh, the former government, this government made a, made a submission supporting uh, a, a decent increase to the minimum wage. And of course, late last year, this government, against the opposition of the coalition, passed legislation which is designed to get wages moving again uh, by giving um, him. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Birmingham. And President, I raise a point of order on the standing order related to the direct relevance of an answer. And I raise this point of order particularly about the direct relevance. Now, this chamber, early in my career, made a change to standing orders that went from requiring relevancy to requiring direct relevancy. Now, this question could not have been a more narrowly or precisely worded question. It was 11 words long, and it asked the minister very clearly whether the current rate of real wages growth was positive or negative. I accept that he has been broadly relevant to the question, but I contest he is not being directly relevant to the question, and I invite you to draw him to the directly relevant question. Thank you, Senator Birmingham, and I will uh, draw the minister to the question. Thank you. Uh, I think it's an established fact uh, that uh, wages growth is not keeping up with inflation at the moment. That is not news. That is in every newspaper that you care to care to read. Uh, but that is uh, not something that this government wants to see go on. And as I say, nominal wages are growing at a higher rate than we ever saw under the coalition government. And that's because, unlike the coalition, we didn't have a low wages as a deliberate design feature of our economic strategy. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Birmingham, second, first supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks President. Uh, on 3 June last year, the Albanese government made a submission to the Fair Work Commission, which the minister has referenced, uh, to the annual wage review that said, and I quote, the government recommends that the Fair Work Commission ensures that the real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards. Minister, will the government make the same recommendation in its submission this year? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. And Minister Watt. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, of course, I'm not in a position to reveal what will be in this government's submission uh, on the next Order. minimum wage case. Uh, uh, but it is the government's policy to continue to make sure um, that we get wages moving again. Uh, and it, as I say, it stands in great contrast to the former government, who had a deliberate design feature of keeping wages low uh, and who never achieved the nominal wage growth that we've managed to achieve just in the last few months that we've been in office. Absolutely. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Well, during the lead up to the election, Prime Minister Albanese consistently promised to ensure that the wages of Australians don't go backwards. The now Minister for Employment said the new government does not want to see Australian workers go backwards. Yep. This minister, this question time, has been able to rule in and out budget measures, and yet he won't give any indication as to what the Fair Work Commission submission will say. Minister, isn't it true that Australian workers are going backwards, that you won't promise to stop them from going even further backwards, and just like your Thank promises you, of lower Senator electricity Birmingham, prices, your you're breaking inside. your promise? Minister. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Birmingham, for giving me another opportunity uh, to confirm how strongly the Albanese government is committed to getting wages moving again. And that's why we're taking action uh, to, to ensure that wages are increased by making submissions to the Fair Work Commission uh, that your Minister government Watt, was never prepared to please do. Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. Despite the minister having quite a resonating loud voice in here, I am struggling to hear. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I'll take that as a compliment. Um, the, this government, unlike the former government, this government is taking action to get wages moving again, passing laws uh, to do so, opposed by the Noalition, uh, making submissions to the Fair Work Commission uh, that the Noalition never was prepared to do, Order. and of course taking action on cost of living relief with cheaper medicines, cheaper childcare, and energy price relief Order. that was yet again opposed by guess who? The Noalition. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. Um, my question is to Senator Wong, uh, the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change Energy. Could the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is working with Australia's biggest emitters to ensure they co contribute a fair share towards our climate target while supporting their economic growth? Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister Wong. 
Thank you. Thank you to Senator Payman for her question. Last month, this government released the proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism. Based on extensive feedback over nearly six months of consultation, reforms carefully designed so Australia's heaviest emitters reduce their emissions and help us to meet help us to meet net zero, your target too, by 2050 commitments. Businesses in this country understand reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness. Oh, I hear them over there. Yeah. Here we go. The government's reforms will ensure that all large facilities, new or existing, are required to reduce their emissions. This sends a strong message a strong message that we are serious about our net zero commitments and serious about supporting business. These are reforms that will help businesses and regional communities transform their operations with a $600 million package as part of a larger $1.9 billion <coughs> Powering the Regions Fund. But after a wasted decade in government, what are we going to see from the other side? What are we going to see? We're going to see, yet again, the Leader of the Opposition, who wants to oppose our reforms because he wants to rehash tired, negative, scare campaigns. You know, as one respected commentator noted, Peter Dutton is like a microwave to Tony Abbott. Reheating pathetic scare tactics and fueling internal divisions. You see, the question for those opposite. The question for those opposite. Are you going to look to the future, or do you just say stuck in your own past? Stuck in your own past. There are those on the other side, and I note that Mr. Mr. Dutton's comments were in response to Senator Birmingham and Senator Bragg actually urging their colleagues to listen to what the electorate said. Thank you, Minister Wong. Um, Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on what has been the response to these critical reforms from business and industry? Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister Wong. I thank Senator Payman for the question. The opportunity to inform the Senate and particularly to remind those opposite who claim to be the party of business just how much support there is. Here's how much support there is from the business community for our changes. The BCA, the AIG, the ACI and the MCA all, all see safeguards reforms as essential to long-term policy and investment that has been lacking after a decade of denial and dysfunction on the other side that we are still witnessing. Jennifer Westacott, Chief Executive of the Business Council, uh, said last week, what we need now is just to get on with it. What I think we don't need is major reversals. Oh, no, Matt, I, they don't like hearing this, do they? Their, 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 their constituency is walking away from you. Andrew McKellar from Aki urging Australians, uh, urging the parliament uh, to get on it with it and urging for a bipartisan Thank you, approach. The time for answering has expired. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on the Albanese government's plan, uh, plans to reward industrial facilities that reduce their emissions and when these reforms were first proposed? Minister Wong. Thank you, Pre President. The safeguard mechanism uh, crediting amendment bill will enable large industrial facilities to earn credits when they reduce their emissions below their baselines. In other words, you try and ensure that they also contribute to the net zero target, which, by the way, those opposite have signed up to. It's a balanced scheme, effective, equitable, efficient, simple, and reforms that were first proposed by Mr Taylor. Oh. Mr Taylor. And there were a recommendation of the 2020 expert panel, which your government accepted and consulted on. Mr. Uh, President, what I'd suggest is the, uh, those opposite might listen, might listen to their leader, Order. who said last year, Order. when you lose elections, Order. it's important to listen and to understand the reasons why you lost. But you can't hear, you don't want to hear, do you? Order. And I ask that Order. further questions be placed on notice. Order. Um, just before senators leave the chamber, could senators please remind any new staff or um, staff who may have forgotten the protocols about entering and leaving the chambers? There's been a couple of staff that have wandered around the wrong way today. Thank you.
No, not any of yours. Senators, please leave the chamber in a demure fashion. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. So, Deputy President, uh, I rise to uh, take note of the answers given to questions by all coalition senators today. And I, I particularly want to, myself and my contribution, take note of the answers given to Senator Birmingham's questions uh, in relation to the cost of living by Senator Watt. Now, uh, what we heard from Senator Watt was just a lot of words, really, and a lot of plans to have a plan. You know, they said, we're, what are we doing to address cost of living? We're taking action. But there was actually no reference to anything they've actually done or anything specific that they're actually going to do that will tangibly deliver reduced cost of living pressure on Australians. Now, we all know out there in the real world, outside of this place, people are doing it tough. Interest rates have been going up. Uh, for, for the average mortgage holder, it's about $10,000 per year. In interest, increase in interest costs. Uh, you go to the shopping centres, and not only will you see that the uh, many many cases the, the shelves are an empty, and because there's supply chain issues, but there's also, of course, costs have gone up significantly, and it's impacting people's ability to be able to make ends meet. It is becoming increasingly difficult to just get by in this country, and all we're getting from this government. It's just words, just words. There's no substance behind anything they're saying because they're just, it's just empty rhetoric. We heard that, uh, that one of the ways that they're addressing cost of living is, is, uh, is decreasing the, the cost of childcare. Well, that's all well and good if you actually have a childcare place, but what we know is that the empty impact of their policy, their, uh, of the legislation that they were able to get through this place, is that it doesn't actually deliver any new places. There's, no, there's not a single new place becoming available. Now, we know that there is a significant shortage of childcare places. We know that there's a significant issue of workforce, and there's nothing that this government is doing to address those issues. So how does an increase in a subsidy assist you if you can't even get access to a childcare place? The point that I'm making here is that they're just really good at putting together some words. But what Australians are starting to figure out, and you know, they've had a bit of a honeymoon, and I get that, and people have given them the benefit of the doubt, as, as good Australians will do, as sensible Australians will do. They will give, they'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But what we're starting to see, as the pressures are really mounting on household budgets, as the pressures are really mounting upon individuals trying to make ends meet, they're starting to figure out that this government, this government is all talk and very little action. And their action is just often symbolic. Their action is just often just talking points rather than actually delivering policies that would deliver real outcomes. One of the things that they said they'd do uh, before the election was that they would deliver a $275 decrease $275 decrease in the cost of energy, in the cost of electricity. Yet they've walked miles away from that. They brought in some policy just before, uh, just before Christmas, thinking it'd be some big Christmas present. Uh, again, another sort of empty delivery of a promise, because we're not actually seeing electricity prices going down. In fact, all they're saying is, oh, they're just going to—they're not going to go up as much as they could have gone up. Well. You know what? That's not going down. That's just maybe limiting it a little bit, and you're touching, playing around the edges. What Australians want to see is a reduction in the cost of making ends meet, and it's getting more and more difficult. And this government, week by week, and we're seeing just this week. I mean, their agenda is just—we're back on uh, filling in time. 
when it comes to uh, uh, the, the you know, government business, which is back onto the uh, address in reply from the Governor General speech, because they don't actually have anything. They've, they've, they've done with the, the talking and they've found that just talking is not enough. Just filling in words and having all those nice, nice announcements and nice little talking points is not enough to actually address the issue that Australians are facing. They talked about real wages going up before the election. But guess what? what? We're not hearing them. They won't even mention the word real anymore because we're not keeping up with inflation. And inflation is out of control and it's out of control. And the, the Reserve Bank is having to take the measures they're taking because they're, they're seeing that this lot over here haven't got the capacity to be able to deliver real outcomes. Senator Sheldon. Well, isn't this amusing? You know, what, have, what has been happening in this chamber? Like, I've been here since the election. You've all been here since the election. And we've seen 60 bills go through this parliament. And let's just name a few of them. An increase in the minimum wage and pay rise for aged care workers. Let's mention a few more of them. That we turned around and decreased childcare, made it cheaper. We turned around and made changes to the Workplace Relations Bill, of course, which they opposed because that dealt with cost of living. Because they didn't want to see real workers get wage increases to deal with the pressures of cost of living. They just wanted to make sure that a very small, minute percentage of this community at the very top end were actually protected so they could exploit Australian workers. Because they wanted to keep wages low. It was part of their policy that was been clearly stated for the last and previous decade. They've kept the same mantra. So that's not doing anything making wages bigger, giving people an opportunity minimum wage increases, an opportunity to negotiate better work arrangements, to make sure that wages do actually increase. Also, those things that build better wages, improve skills, a very important initiative because there's been a dead hand put on the skills development in this country by those opposite. That's what they did for a decade, lost apprenticeships, lost skills, lost capacity couldn't turn around and even support our universities during the biggest crisis this country and this world has seen in over 100 years. What do they do? They drain off the Australian community and, they pay, and we all as a community pay the price. Well, 60 bills and these changes that we've made have made a difference. Deliver the regional first home buyers guarantee. Another important increase and improvement in arrangements. Cheaper medicines. These are fundamental things that support and basically give a chance for those that are struggling to deal with the cost of living pressures that exist in our community. And to say and come in here and say that dealing with and containing prices, reducing the pressure on prices for electricity and gas, something they voted against because they didn't like the idea the market would get regulated. Now, actually, what they didn't like is that their mates were going to be regulated. The mates that actually turn around and support them were going to get regulated. That's the problem. They vote against workers' pay increases. They vote against the opportunity for workers to negotiate better arrangements with their employers across industries. They vote against containing uh, electricity prices. What do they do? They vote against making sure the cost of living and cost of living initiatives are put into this economy. And to hear a list of questions asked about fuel tax. I mean, I've only got to go to these are the people that turned around and did not even consult with the transport industry, 6 per cent of the Australian economy, a significant uh, place they play in making sure the Australian economy runs, many of them single owner operators, small and medium sized businesses. They turned around and got rid of the fuel tax credit system. And what they did as a result of that that drivers were not able to get the fuel tax credit basis back as a result of the pricing that was put forward by clients within the industry. And when they took complaints and problems up to Freudenberg and to Morrison at the time, there was no answer. And of course, what those industry players said, the Transport Workers Union, of course, the largest small business road transport organisation and probably the small, largest small business organisation in this country by numbers. The Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, a national road transport employer group representing small, medium and large operators. The National Road Freighters Association, a group of well-meaning owner-drivers that have 
do largely long distance work. And of course, Nat Road, the National Road Transport Association, all said quite clearly what the previous government did was strangling road transport without consultation. And no matter how much they pleaded with Freudenberg, with Morrison, with those opposite, there wasn't a voice lifted, nor was there a voice lifted by Senator Mackenzie in support of those people in this chamber. Because we raised it on a number of occasions and it was dead silence on the opposite side. They did not support the transport industry. And of course, when that industry called out and asked for support and said, we need this to be fixed, and they spoke to the, to the um, government, the now government, the Albanese government, it was fixed. It was fixed because we listened to what that industry was saying. That fuel tax credit system has been re-put really back into place. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Deputy President. I've only been here a short time, and something I've learnt very quickly is governing is hard. And most of the people I hear come with great intentions. They are good people. They are here to make a better Australia. But it's impossible to get everything right. But when the game's on the line, champions want the ball. It's been nine months since this government has been in the office. That's enough for people who overly celebrated Labor's win or those who sought solace, those coalition supporters who sought solace in the arms of others to be decorating nurseries or planning deliveries or something else. But we still get everything bad is of the previous government and everything good is by them. And you can't take credit for things if you don't take responsibility for things. Yeah. We've heard 60 bills have passed but they haven't addressed the problems that face us now. It's a very narcissistic trait to project the faults upon others. It's a very narcissistic trait not to take ownership of your own situations. Now, we can stand here and we can say that wages are up, and they are. I'm not going to sit here and play points that they aren't, but real wages are not. And that was the question we had today. How are people going out there in the world? And as a group of people, I know we all have the Australians' interest in heart, and it's time for honesty on these things. What can we do about them? And so we look here and we're watching where the actions aren't matching the intentions, they're not matching the words. On our first question today, we're talking about uh, data and security of the nation, we're talking about cameras, we're talking about these things. I woke up and I saw this news article about Hikvision and uh, DAR devices out there. I think this is an interesting story. I then had the very personal self-reflection that about three weeks ago I had a number of Hikvision security cameras installed in my house and I realised that Senator Patterson's story is going to cost me about $5,000 to rectify. And we heard how these cameras were installed under our watch and it's our problem. But that ignores the fact that in November of last year the United Kingdom and the United States identified that this was a problem. They announced that this was a problem. They announced that these were being withdrawn from use within their government buildings. Surely the government of the time should have seen that and said, let's have a look at it in Australia. Let's see what is going on here with that problem. But we didn't. Governing, governing is hard. There are millions of moving pieces. I've never seen a more complex thing in my life. But that is the ownership champions take. I have seen this. This has happened. I will do something. And Australians have been through too much. Since 2020, we have been locked down. We've been told what to put in our bodies, where to go, what not to go, everything like that. It is time for these people to have a life, to do things they enjoy, and for us to take the responsibility of having the ball driving the game and winning the game for them. We shouldn't have to make them fear every little thing, everything about their wages, every bill, every mortgage payment, everything about climate change, the world's going to end, the Chinese are spying, my car's going to drop, kill me. All of this, as a parliament, we are putting on them to, to scare them, to fear them, to manipulate them, and that is a thing we should be taking on. So, when we talk about ownership, we had the question about the diesel fuel rebate today. I, for one, would like to thank the government for clearing that up and giving clarity that that will not be changed going forward. 
There is no you know, hatred or anger on these things. When good decisions are made, they should be celebrated as much as pointed out the bad ones. Because there are farmers out near Moree, up near Tamworth, who are planning on spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each, millions of dollars in some cases, to plant crops. And they will sit there and they'll look at the cost of diesel, the cost of seed, the cost of fertiliser, the massive amount of money families will put out on a hope that it doesn't flood, that it doesn't drought, that it doesn't pesticide, that it doesn't mice plague. And that is some certainty that you have given today. So thank you for that. But I also ask on all these other points, on the wages, real wages, on security, if we are to be a government and a parliament that cares about our people, let us take that on, let us act with maturity, and let's give the people a break they deserve. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, my good friend, Senator Cadell over there, we've started Senate together, um, Senate school together, and it's great that you've pointed out a very important point that it is impossible to get everything right. And you would imagine that people in government for almost a decade would at least get close to getting things right, but no. So the reason why we're having this debate is because it's very interesting to see the other side pretend to care now when the question earlier came up about why the Minister for Environment closed the central Queensland coal mine. And we're getting attacked for that as, as though we don't care about the environment or as Senator O'Sullivan pointed out that we're all talk but no action. But let me be clear that after a decade of no action promoting ener uh, renewable energy, which the other side clearly failed and failed miserably, it's really interesting to see that when they see a responsible minister for environment in Tanya Plibersek, um, who is taking action to close the mine, and this may be the first time that a decision like this has been made in 22 years, that this decision was made on the premise of it having unacceptable impacts on the Great Barrier Reef, which is responsible for about $6 billion worth of economic activity every year and 64,000 jobs. Now, we're talking about job security. We're talking about creating more jobs for Australians out there. And there is, there's Clive Palmer who wants to challenge this decision. It is really shocking to know that those on the other side uh, are questioning this or are quite confused about why the minister would make such an important decision. Well, I'm proud of being part of a government who puts priority on the environment. Because when we went to the election, we heard each and every person in Western Australia and across Australia implore to us on how important it is to save the environment, to prioritise it and to put it on the agenda as a matter of importance. Because at the end of the day, what, what are we fighting for here if we don't have a planet to live on? Um, and to, for those on the other side, just for a piece of clarity that that mine was an export only mine. There's no coal in it. It wouldn't be producing any coal into our energy grid. And after you know having all those policies during your time, 22 attempts According to the record, there was zero success rate. So you couldn't even land an energy policy. And if you really cared about the energy policy, why did you vote against us when, when we went into the election and we brought it to this chamber um, to reduce emissions by 2030 and, and put a target of 43%? Why didn't you support us? And like in, in the light of all this talk of being mature, of being responsible and open and transparent. That's what this Albanese Labor government has been indicating from the day we've been elected. We're sick and tired of the delay and denial and the destruction we've seen, and Australians want to see action, and action is what they're seeing with this government. We really need to bring into attention that the government's policies are very clear. 
We've been honest with the Australian people. We've indicated how much of uh, bad policies have impacted the, the time that we're in government now and all the mess that we need to clean up. There's been, aside from the emissions reduction target um, and ensuring that we've got a clear path to net zero by 2050, um, that we've also committed to the policies of a $20 billion for rewiring the nation, $3 billion in the National Reconstruction Fund for renewables and low emission technologies, um, stronger laws to protect the ozone layer, signing the methane pledge. Like, these are things that are important to everyday Australians, and if those opposite really cared, you should talk to your constituents and listen. Be even if you're on the other side, you still are part of this parliament and you need to listen because perhaps then you'll get a clearer understanding of what they're trying to say to you. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, in eight months, Australians are seeing that the Labor that they voted for is not the Labor that is governing. We see continued efforts by Labor to deflect answers at question time. They don't want to answer the question. They don't want to take responsibility for anything that they've done. They clearly don't want to take responsibility for their broken promises. And Senator Birmingham asked a very legitimate question, given the fact that during the lead-up to the election and the promises made by uh, the, uh, the then opposition leader, now Prime Minister, that he wanted to see real wages continuing to increase. And Australians have seen in just short, eight short months that that is not going to happen, an admission by the government now that it won't happen. It's just like the promise that they made of $275 a year in reduction in energy prices, which now will not pass the lips of any Labor member of parliament. That promise is gone, and so the empty promises, the broken promises, are now starting to pile up. In eight short months, the broken promises are starting to pile up. I don't know how many times I heard Mr Albanese saying that he had a plan for the economy. It's become increasingly apparent that he has no plan for the economy because every time something goes wrong, he says we have to go out and talk to people. He said he had a plan. There is no plan there to implement, absolutely no plan to implement. And as has been said earlier, um, cheaper childcare is an important thing for the Australian economy. But not everyone has children and not everyone is um, reaping the benefit of that, but they are reaping the, the, the problem of increasing energy prices. And I have to say uh, what we're looking forward to, what's being predicted out of the gas markets, for example, is a continuing increase in the price of gas because there will be less gas because of the intervention of the Labor Party. And Mr Deputy President, only the Labor Party could spend a billion and a half dollars to put gas prices up when they promised to bring them down. Only the Labor Party could do that. But we're seeing the same thing starting to emerge. It's the same old Labor. Deflect the problem. Cute language. Blame somebody else. Blame the previous government. Never take responsibility for anything that you've done yourself. And of course, when the questions get really hard, descend into personal abuse. Start hurling abuse across the chamber, and we see that so many times. How does that work in a post-Jenkins world in this place? Not conducive to that sort of respect that the Prime Minister promised, a kind of parliament. Wasn't there a memo that went out? Did the Prime Minister, was, the, was the Prime Minister the only one that got the memo? Did the other ministers in his government get the memo as well? They don't seem to be following it. Or is it just when someone's asking the Prime Minister a question that the memo applies? I reckon that's the case. Don't ask the Prime Minister any hard questions. Don't ask him about him keeping his promises. Wages going up higher than inflation. Cheaper power prices. All we're seeing is the same old Labor. We all know, particularly those of us on this side, that Labor can't manage the economy. We've seen it time after time after time. We remember the pink bats. We remember the school halls. 
We remember the extraordinary spending that went on uh, during the global financial crisis, and we remember that Labor wanted us to spend $6 billion asking Australians to get vaccinated when all we had to do was give them a good reason to get vaccinated, and they did. They turned out in their droves. So here we have re-emerging the same old Labor, and it's mostly the same people from 2007 to 2013, mostly the same people, and we're going to get the same results. We know that Labor can't handle the economy. They'll try and blame everybody else, they'll try and deflect, they'll try and abuse, and they'll try to put it off onto somebody else. But Labor, we know. 6,000 words we found out. They want to take economic policy back to the 1970s. They want to undo the reforms of Hawke and Keating that were so important in the last 30 years of economic prosperity in this country. It is the same old Labor. We shouldn't forget that. They won't keep their promises and they won't take responsibility for that and they won't own up. I put the question. Those the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the responses to the questions I asked of the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Well, at a time when Australians are labouring under a cost of living crisis, at a time when uh, food prices are skyrocketing, petrol prices, medicine, transport, rents, mortgages, electricity, insurance payments are all skyrocketing. It is a massive injustice that this government is even considering going ahead with quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts for the super wealthy. Now, even the, the International Monetary Fund, one of the absolute architects and cheerleaders of neoliberalism around the planet, has suggested that these tax cuts should be reassessed. Yet this government, in its blind pursuit of lining the pockets of the already very wealthy people in this country, is ignoring the cries of working class people who are struggling to make ends meet. These stage three tax cuts used to be Mr Morrison's tax cuts. He conceived of them when he was treasurer and he legislated for them when he was Prime Minister. But these are no longer Mr Morrison's tax cuts. These stage three tax cuts for the super wealthy are now Labor's tax cuts, because Labor brought down a budget after the election that included these tax cuts, and Labor have confirmed as recently as Senator Gallagher's answer to my questions this afternoon, that these tax cuts are still Labor's policy. As uh, my colleague Senator Shoebridge says, they love the billionaires. Now, the important thing to know is that Labor has never been able to run an argument that these tax cuts are good policy. And of course, that's because Labor knows they're not good policy. So why does Labor support them? Well, because in their own self-interest they decided prior to the election that they had to support them. Labor's position boils down to this. They're going to support policy that they know is wrong. And they're doing it because they promised to do something that they knew was wrong. And we're in the middle of an inflation spike in this country at the moment. You've got the RBA basically going rogue, using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, trying to use old style um, uh, interest rate rises, which work well when it's a demand side driven price spiral, but don't work when it's a supply side price spiral, which is what we're in now. And the reason the RBA feels it has to do that is because Dr Chalmers, the Treasurer, has abandoned the field. He's run for cover. He won't use the powers that he's got in the Reserve Bank of Australia Act to actually override the RBA 
on interest rates. He won't pull any of the massive taxation levers he's got at his disposal. So when you consider Labor's political cowardice on the stage three tax cuts with Dr Chalmers' cowardice in refusing to implement anti-inflationary tax policy and refusing to use the power that he has to override the RBA, we're left with a situation now where we're going to get super inflationary stage three tax cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars of pump priming the economy in the most inflationary way conceivable at a time when they come into play when, according to the Reserve Bank, inflation will still be above the target band. Now, the Treasurer says Labor's got a plan for inflation. It is inconceivable that that plan includes putting $9,000 a year into the pockets of billionaires. These are Labor's tax cuts. They have to own them and they should walk away from them. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it.